Yeah. Alright guys, hi I'm, I'm Matt, Matt Callanan, this is uh, Angus at, at the back there. Uh, we run the, the DevOps Brisbane meetup and it's, it's great to see you guys uh, here tonight. So tonight we've got two, two, um, two parts to the, to the meetup, we're going to talk about DevOps at Wadi. Um, we have pizza halfway through and then we're going to come back and talk about the DevOps Days conference which is coming to Brisbane uh, next month, which is going to be really good. So um, uh, we're just going to pretty much get straight into the first first uh, talk, DevOps at What If. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm Matt Kelly. Um, I'm a developer, I work at, at What If Group, and I've been there for about two years. Yeah, and I'm Alex, I've been at What If for about five years, uh, and I'm a sysadmin. Uh, so What If Group, um, I'm guessing a lot of people have heard of whatif.com, it's a great local Brisbane success story, started in a garage, <coughs> garage somewhere here in Brisbane, uh, about the year 2000. Uh, it's, it now employs almost 600 people around the world in 17 different countries. And those, uh, those logos you down, see down the bottom, they're all part of the, the What If group. So, a lot of really strong local Australian brands and, and Asian brands. So, tonight um, we're going to talk a bit about a story about how we went from uh, a really siloed, uh, typical traditional IT setup to a more collaborative, uh, DevOps y type of setup. Um, how we, how we worked away out of a, a downward spiral and, and try to find a way forward. Um, how we uh, move from manual to automatic. And look at how do we how do we reduce cycle times and trying to release to production. The DevOps is a pretty big topic. We could talk for hours about a lot of a lot of different things. But particularly, what cultural issues did we overcome? Technology issues and how did we reduce the, the amount of time it took to, to release our software? So we're going to look at a bit at the, the background and some of the problems that, that we were having. Um, look at some of the solutions that we, we tried to put in place and then pull out some of the principles that, that we learned from that. Yeah, so we'll start off with um, a little bit of history lesson. Um, I started with What If in 2009. Um, when I came on board, we were utilising a managed hosting provider. Um, they managed all of our operating systems, so hardware, networking equipment. Um, we had about maybe half a dozen Java apps deployed in um, Glassfish containers. Um, ops had sort of limited uh, access to server hardware and we just basically performed application deployments and supported apps uh, and the development teams um, sort of supported us. Um, in 2010 we ditched a managed hosting provider uh, and went to Colon in Sydney. Um, we, the operations team at the time, built the environment from the ground up so obviously we had full access to it and also we took on full responsibilities for it. Um, the first thing we did, obviously, was lock it down so developers didn't have root access. Um, at the same time, we brought more servers on board than what we had in managed. Uh, and always, we are bringing new apps online, so all in all, the workload for ops just sort of kept climbing. Um, and a little bit of a communication barrier started creeping in between development and ops, I think, um, as it so often does. Um, fast forward. Um, over the next couple of years, more and more staff coming on board uh, on both sides of the fence. Uh, many more applications, probably at this point we had maybe 50 or 60 different apps, all still in separate Glassfish containers, uh, and probably 100 to 120 servers in production, and maybe a couple of hundred extra just in different environments. Um, Ops was still deploying all of, our, all of the applications, but every release was getting more painful, more large, like larger, uh, and things were degrading in terms of communication between dev and ops. It was pretty much got to a throw stuff over the wall and hope for the best situation. Yeah, so uh, I came on board around the year 2012 and I saw what, if you've ever read the Phoenix Project and, and read anything by Gene Kim, you'll understand the, the idea of the downward spiral that things kind of keep, keep getting worse and worse, the self reinforcing negative. Um, situation. Uh, we saw a, a lot of really entrenched silos so I sort of talked about the throwing over the wall and these were kind of getting worse and worse each day due to a lot of, a lot of the issues. Um, they, they built up over time like no one set out to you know, set up silos, we're going to set up a silo today and that's, that's the way we're going to work, it just happens over time. Um, the, the, the outcome of that was a lot of exasperated developers, uh, a lot of over constrained operations, developers were trying to get their stuff out operations trying to stem, stem the flow of stuff going into production. No one really liked the situation, uh, no one really liked the, the, a lot of the issues that, that were there at the time, but no one knew how to, 
how to change it, knowing who to talk to or find an avenue or a way forward. Part of the symptoms of this were really, really by release overheads. So it would take uh, quite a long time to, to get your changes out and into production. So a really long cycle time if you consider from when development's complete to when it's actually in production. And this was largely due to a huge amount of manual overhead or manual activity in terms of deployment, in terms of testing. We'll talk a bit more about that. This kind of had the effect of, of driving up the batch sizes. So you wanted to release an application but it affected the other applications. Um, in order to release your app, you had to go into a, a calendar system and wait for it to be released. But by then, you need a whole bunch of other changes to also do that. So you end up batching up a lot of applications and a lot of changes. And that had the effect of making things worse because releases became more complicated, more and more manual activity. It was harder to release. It just kept getting worse and snowballing from there. There was a calendar of doom, so you had to book a slot uh, to, to release to the staging environment or to the production environment. And it was unpredictable prior prioritization. So you might have booked a slot to release, but by the time you get there, there's another much higher priority project that's come along, and they have to go through. And they, they might have problems. They might need to run a 48-hour load run, which will block you. And that might fail, but they're still high priority. They've got to get their stuff fixed and out the door, so you're back and back in, in the queue. What I'd call a superstitious gatekeeping process, um, just built over tradition. We, we have to do this in order to, to mitigate risk. We have to always load, load tests for 48 hours. Small changes, even without you know, without introspecting between the, the different um, the different silos, so in order to prevent the possibility of risky release, put a put a wall up there. Uh, applications would stagnate; it would be really hard to change legacy code and find a way forward. And the continuous delivery book has a list of anti patterns for releasing, and it kind of read like a list of uh, somebody gone around with a with a checklist and recorded that how actual practices. This is that list, so. Right, straight from the book, extensive detailed release documentation. Thick. We had confluence um, confluence pages with a lot of uh, manual instructions that would vary um, between releases and, and wouldn't be exactly predictable. Relying on manual testing to confirm the app's correct. Yep. So uh, a lot of manual testing during during release. Explaining why deployment's going wrong on release day. So we'd have these big chat rooms where you'd have developers, ops, BAs, testers, you know, up to you know six or seven people in a chat room held up for hours from doing anything else except releasing and then ops saying, why doesn't this command work? And where is this command? And dev saying, oh, I'm sure I updated that. You know, frequent um, corrections to the release process as part of that. Environments that differ in their configs, so um, a lot of divergence between, especially the Puppet, puppet repositories used in test environments for production. And releases would take more than a few minutes, so releases would take hours, literally. And you know, unpredictable due to the manual, large amount of manual. Plus, on top of all of this, all of these problems that were snowballing, we were then migrating to a microservice architecture approach. So we were splitting down old legacy apps, um, creating brand new applications. The, the number of applications that we were building was uh, was exploding. So um, on top of all the, the current negative situation, we're just making matters worse, and it's sort of the reference to the downward spiral. All three of the roles um, involved in getting stuff out to prod the hands-on roles, the developers, QA, and ops, we have a lot of manual activity. Um, manual tagging release process for, for devs, uh, disparate build servers as well, so no one could really see what other teams were building, ops didn't have visibility into what devs were doing. And uh, deploys were actually done by different teams, so developers would sort of do the code, and then hand it over, <coughs> and QA would pick it up from there, and ops, and there was a lot of um, wasted, wasted time that would elapse between those various roles. QA uh, would have to manually deploy themselves, so um, grab an RPM from a build, SCP into a YUM repo, SSH onto a box, run YUM commands, run start and stop commands, a lot of manual activity. Um, environments were different, a lot of manual testing as well, but on top of all the, the manual activity that they needed to maintain their environments, there wasn't much time left to do the actual regression testing. And ops had to do manual deploys, they had giant cheat sheets, so uh, for each application there was a cheat sheet, you could go and say, uh, these are the idiosyncrasies of this app and this is what we should do. When we need to restart it. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, ops have to remember to consult the cheat sheet. Um, and, and frequently, devs would forget to update it, ops would forget to consult it, that sort of situation. Yeah, so we, um, we've been doing agile um, in our development space for quite a few years now. So um, obviously, dev teams would be doing their iterations and getting things ready for release, except that when it came to getting to staging and further into production, production 
was very much a queuing system, so you'd be waiting for weeks and weeks behind all of the other dev teams who were trying to get work out. And once you got up to the top of the queue, um, you'd, you'd be able to get into staging and then resolve all of the issues in there over a number of days and then do a load test for maybe 48 hours, which would probably have to happen over a weekend. And then you'd get to a gatekeeping process, which would take 48 hours again if you were lucky. Um, and then you might be able to have the opportunity to go into production, except the first, you know, sign problem, you'd be kicked back out to the bottom of the release queue. So it was a little bit painful <laughs> for development teams. Um, and it was also painful for ops. So our release notes would, as Matt mentioned, be big, long compliments pages. So for one app, you would have maybe a dozen lines that we'd copy and paste um, from compliments into an SSH session and then you log into two other machines to deploy the exact same application and wait for manual testing after each deployment, which took 20 minutes, half an hour, so you couldn't really switch focus onto anything else. You had to wait, you can't really do much in 20 minutes. Um, and then and during the same release, you've got another app on two more servers and then another app on another server and then some manual database scripts and then, you know. So all in all, a release like that, I lifted this, this um, example from a, a release in uh, 2011, and it probably took around five to six hours. Um, it wasn't fun at all. So, I'm talking about some solutions now. Yeah, so we're just going to cover some of the, the, uh, the things that we tried to put in place. So we talk a bit about standardization, some of the technical solutions we looked at, uh, the team structure and how we changed that, and then uh, this thing called, called Slipway. So lightweight standardization, as I mentioned, we were, we were moving to a microservice architecture approach. So we're kind of going from a JWE container-based approach built on Flux, which is a tool called DropWizard. DropWizard is an opinionated Java framework uh, designed to be ops-friendly, high-performance, uh, really easy to deploy, really easy to start. It basically cobbles together a lot of really mature, stable Java libraries, kind of the best, best of a bunch, and puts packages them up together to make it easy for you it's opinionated, so a lot of the choices have already been made. It basically gave us 80% of what we do at that volume, so it made sense to move to that. And moving from the, the container-based to the, to the lightweight, more, more jetty-based approach, um, it was a lot faster to deploy, a lot simpler to maintain, simpler to, to deploy to production. Uh, we were able to trim down a lot of the stuff that we didn't really need from, from, uh, from the container to in, get the container-based approach, so that like a, a complex admin GUI console that you wouldn't know if someone else had modified things, whereas with um, a simpler approach like this, it has a really simple configuration, a config YAML file on the file system that everyone can see exactly what's going on. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to moving to it, but we'd also built up a lot of scripts around how to uh, control our bus fish apps um, when they were running in, in, in an environment. Uh, when we moved across to, to the library, we didn't have any of that, and we were trying to encourage a, a, a culture of freedom uh, where developers could could feel free to quickly spin up applications. But the um, problem is this idea of combinatorial explosion. So pretty quickly we had about you know, 12 of these lightweight apps within a couple of months of saying, yep, architect said, yep, we're, architect said, yep, we're gonna go to uh, microservice. Um, so you can imagine, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of things you can do, a lot of different choices you can make when you create an application. And if there's a lot of freedom there. Um, it's great to have flexibility, but um, ultimately ops are gonna be the ones that are waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning and trying to type commands in and, you know, apps behave slightly differently, that's just going to you know, explode the, the amount of stuff that we're going to need in our cheat sheet and the, the silos between dev and ops just become, become worse and try to fix a problem that we're going to make, make things a lot worse. So what we need to do is try and find a balance between flexibility and, and predictability. So we want that culture of freedom, the ability to quickly adapt to new technologies and be nimble and, and, and a way forward for legacy code. But um, it's, it's also good to have, have those opinions and, and find uh, common ground where we can all agree that this is where we want to go forward. So how do we do it? How do we pr promote that culture of freedom and responsibility but find a way to provide predictability? Standards doesn't have to be a dirty word. So, um, as our architect said, any standard's better than no standard. Um, you know, ultimately, people, people want to do the right thing by everybody else, but if you just give an ultimate freedom, then you'll just do whatever's the easiest thing uh, to, to get it out there as quick as possible. So what we need to do is find, find a way to make it, make it easy to, to do the right thing what we said was that we'd, we'd standardize on the packaging and the way that applications were deployed, uh, but we would leave it up to, up to developers how they actually built their applications. So 
within your code base, you can do whatever you want, whatever the decisions make, make sense for you. You can get the latest technology. Um, but when it comes to what's, how it's deployed, uh, and also how the apps communicate with each other, then we have to standardize on that. So we started defining some standards. Uh, we just used Confluence, created a Confluence page called Application Deployment Standards 1.0. It was a draft version. Uh, it was open for anyone to chip in with really good ideas and say, well, I think we should do this. So the config files should, should have this standard format. It should <coughs> exist in this standard place. And the port numbers should, should, should be like this. Um, it was kind of hard to sometimes extract input from people um, to get their opinions on what, like everyone seems to have an opinion when something's gone wrong and say, oh, they should have done it like this or they should do this. But when it comes to nailing down actual opinions, it can be, can be a bit harder. So uh, we sort of incentivize that by saying, oh, I'll say this is going to make your life easier at, at 2 a.m. if you can tell me what you think should happen. And to dare say, this is going to make releases a lot faster. So yeah, lots of emails, IMs, and different one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, we kind of went through this life cycle, the idea of, um, come up with the idea and then trial it out. Someone could go, I really think we should do it like this, and then go and test it out and try it. Um, then come together and go through kind of a few different rounds of agreeing and disagreeing and coming up and refining the draft. And ultimately we would you know, finalize the draft and say, yep, this is good. And we would implement it in our, in our applications. Um, and any further refinements from that, we could create a new version of the standards built on that. And we could provide a way, way forward. So we can just keep, keep the standards nimble, keep moving forward, but also support the best ideas that we had in, in the past. Some example standards. So you can imagine all of these different things, logging, um, what Puppet should do, your file permissions, metrics, your cron jobs, your endpoints, SSL. You can imagine if you don't have any, any sort of like common idea about what should go on with these things, that, that idea of combinatorial explosion. You know, we've, we've probably got around 90 applications, I think, that would. A certain number of those that have already moved to microservice architecture. So there's a lot of possibilities of ways of interacting with apps. So this is just an example page from Confluence. Uh, you can see the, the versions up the top. You can easily navigate between the versions. This is just an example of a specification in there. These are the log format that, that you should use in your, in your configuration. So this is a good example of you know developers and ops need to agree on this because um, ops are going to be the ones you know at 2 a.m. in the morning trying to trying to read through log files and if they're subtly different apps are just that extra level of complexity and ambiguity that they need to, to keep in their heads. And also for uh, tools that we want to build, talk about logging, that you know, you know, get a uh, collate all of the logs from all the different servers and provide a, a good view onto what's going on in the systems. They need to know that this is reliable. And then right at the end of the um, standards page, there's a section where you can add a future edition. So I think we should do reverse stack trace logging um, and try and get that into the next version. And someone's put a comment on there, he's saying something about logging as well. Uh, so we will come in the, the next round of discussions, how are we going to improve the standards? What have we learned from the last time? How are we going to improve them? We'll come back and we can harvest um, some, some ideas that didn't quite make it into the last version. We also create a, a reference implementation called Hello World Service. And this is a service that only exists to implement the standards. And it's used to test all of our automation that we've built up around deploying and, and testing. And it can actually be deployed to production in all environments. It doesn't have any business logic. It's not going to affect anyone in, in the real world. Um, so you can freely opt devs and ops. Anyone can, can contribute to the code base and get ideas and trial out different things and innovation. And that can then um, be the testing ground that can flow through to other apps. But the standards are kind of pointless if you don't have any, any way of verifying them. So if we say, yes, this is the login format that all apps should use, when it comes to releasing it to production, if ops can get it, <coughs> Find, um, find an app that doesn't fit that login format, they're not going to have the power as much as they want to say, hey, this is really going to hurt us at 2am, I, I don't want to release it. But by that point in time, they're not going to have the power to say, say no, because um, by that point, the business is jumping down the throat saying, we have to get it out yesterday. Uh, so we need to sort of bring, bring the verification that we've got. The standards that we've all agreed on is actually being met and try and bring that verification back as close as possible to the time when the app's created rather than the, in production where it's kind of too late, the horse is kind of bolted. So what we did is we created a, a test suite and we use, we use Fabric for that. Fabric's um, an SSH library built on top of Python. It's really good for running commands remotely. And uh, we came up with a suite of tests and critically they're, they're backwards compatible so you can run, run the same suite of tests against any version and they'll only verify that particular <coughs> version. Here's some examples of what Fabric would do to verify. We jump on a box and run you know, RPM, YAM, list, um, various different commands to verify that we were fitting into what we all agreed was the best 
best practice. And this is an example output from running Fly's tests. So you can see there's 27 tests here. Um, they're all passing, but you can see there's some that are skips. So this is uh, version 2.3, version 2.3 um, targeted version of the standards. And it's skipping here uh, com compliance tests that only apply to version 1 or 1.1. Um, so it's a good way to be able to do that. And we provided migration notes in, on each version of the standard, so it was really easy. You know, at version 2.0, you're creating the best, the best application that you know how. And we've, we've all come together and agreed these are the best ideas to put in place into our applications. Um, but we've moved on from 2.0, so that app that was at 2.0, uh, we're now at 2.3. We need to find a way for them to, to be able to move forward, to keep, keep people moving, keep innovation coming, keep, keep that stuff coming through, um, without just pointing fingers at them and saying, hey, you need to update actually providing a path forward. So each version of the standards has a, uh, like a little nav bar in the migration notes section. So if this particular one is on the version 2.2 page that tells you how to migrate from the previous 2.1 version. So you can, um, if you're at 2.0, you can click on all of the links to, to take you there. And what we found was um, in our first version of the standards, we standardized on the contents of the package, the RPM that we deploy. So you should have these files and these permissions, it should look like this. We were, that, that made it really easy for us to actually standardize deployment and automate the actual deployment of that and kind of get, move, start moving away from some of the manual activity. Um, once we've done that, we we're also able to say, hey, all the contents of the RPMs, they're actually copy and paste from different projects. So we have a, a lot of projects, and what we found was that we were copy and pasting the contents of the RPM. We could extract that out and put it into Puppet. And the benefit of using Puppet for conflict management for our apps was that then Ops also had the ability to contribute and um, you know, put in uh, some, some innovations that they wouldn't previously have been able to because they would have to go and change, you know, 50, 60 different apps and different code bases and try and coordinate the release cycles of all of those to get that improvement out. And we're also able to mandate smoke tests. So part of that problem was the idea of manual testing in production and production in all environments. We were able to say, hey, look, uh, we're going to provide you a path to automate that testing. So if you provide a smoke test chat script with your package, with your RPM, that to production, then we'll run it as part of the, the build, part of the rolling upgrade. We will run it smoke test. And if it fails, we will fail the release because that's what you've heard. We've all agreed it should, should be the right thing. The smoke test basically are the lights on, so um, some happy path tests that developers and testers can collaborate and agree this is what we think it means that, um, that it's good to go for production. Um, and critically, you should only really put things in there that are different between different environments probably done all of your acceptance testing in earlier environments, but there might be small, small tweaks between different environments that you want to test. Cool. So um, we're just going to talk about a few technical solutions for a few minutes, just a couple of Puppet related things and then some information about our um, deployment strategy thingy. Um, so we settled on Puppet for configuration management in 2011, ops settled, I should say. Um, we solve to management as a way to solve um, a particular orchestration problem we're having around testing our disaster recovery environment, so tearing down every application and then bringing them all back up in order. Um, but secretly, we really just wanted configuration management because it's handy for an ops team. Um, the problem is that ops don't actually manage our test environments. We only manage our production staging environments, which sounds a bit weird, but let's go with it. Um, so we, we started our Puppet repo and it was awesome and we were like, yeah, add stuff to Puppet. And the developers were like, oh, that looks really good. We should use that in the test environments too. So they took a, a clone of it and they started developing. Except they didn't send the stuff back to us and we also didn't really care about their stuff so we didn't <laughs> give them our stuff either. So um, by 2013 we were like, okay, this has to stop. We have to be operating off the same code base because the differences between our environments are killing us. So we merged them back together and to get around the fact that we had heaps of environment specific code in the manifests, we pretty much just wrapped big giant blocks and if you're in the test environment do this, but if you're in production go and do this instead. Um, as you can imagine, that made things a little bit, like it was better, but still pretty much impossible to test changes in the test environment that we tested 
sort of to get changes promoted through environments like um, like for instance if you need a uh, change in puppet uh, around a, to do with a release like associated with a release you didn't really have any way to get that through in a nice um, smooth manner so the first thing I'll talk about is branching so as I mentioned a couple of times Prod is locked down and Puppet's locked down as well, production Puppet. Um, ops gatekeep all commits onto master because um, if any of you have used configuration management, which I'm sure most of you have, um, having access to something like Puppet pretty much is the same as having root access to the machine. If you can commit to the code base, then you can do what you want. Um, so we had a big problem, how can devs contribute to the code base? Um, we looked at the kind of git flow models, like doing a, a develop branch and having Onto that and then merging up to master, but it wasn't really working for us. We're kind of things still, even after the merge, the, you know, the great merge of 2013, people still weren't merging back up to master, and, and changes on master still weren't making it back down into the sort of develop branch. Um, so, um, as I say, in, I think in the continuous delivery book, the problem isn't branching, the problem is merging it back together. Um, so we were staring down the throat of Clone Wars mug. Um, so we came up with this idea of the virtual branch. Um, basically, for each of our test environments, we grab Etsy Puppet, which is where all the Puppet manifests are kept, and we get rid of it every night. Uh, then we check out a brand new copy of Master, and we go and get a list of all the branches, the feature branches that developers have been working on for that test environment, and we merge them onto top, on top of our fresh copy of Master. Um, we maintain that list in a tool called Hira. I don't know how many people are familiar with Hira. It's just um, a, a YAML-based data store hierarchical thing for Puppet. It's pretty cool. Like we do a lot of stuff with it, but um, we maintain it there. And you know, if there's a branch that conflicts with Master, then we just skip it and, and fail to build. But the branch is still build, um, and we skip branches that don't exist. Uh, but critically, if a branch was added more than a couple of weeks ago, we don't merge it in anymore. So that encourages people to not just say, oh, put branch X in test environment two and leave it for three years, like, because they'll have to keep re-adding it if they care about the feature. So it encourages people to merge that into master so they don't have to care about it anymore. Um, but I think the best thing about doing it this way is that a human doesn't have to care about the state of Puppet in the test environments. Like, it just works. Uh, if you want a feature, you add it, and then it'll evaporate if you don't care about it anymore, or you merge it up, and you know that it's been tested. So, the second thing I want to talk about around Puppet was something I alluded to just before. Um, if you've got a change in Puppet that's related to a release that you want to get out to production, wrapping it in a conditional that says, if you're in the test environment, do this and then modifying the conditional when you go to staging to say, if you're in the test environment or you're in staging, then do, do this. And then before you go to production, saying, okay, if you're in the staging environment or the test environments or production, then do it. That's bad. That's really unmaintainable. People make mistakes all the time and it means that you're changing the public code base like in the middle of a release, basically. So what did we do? We came up with feature switches. We use feature switches heavily in our application code. We um, back our app feature switches with a centralized Zookeeper service. So we were like, oh, hmm, it seems like a good idea. Maybe we can use this for Puppet. So um, we decided to put our feature switches in Hira, which is the tool I was just talking about. Um, we called them gimmicks because we wanted to um, reinforce the idea that they're temporary, they're for changes that are supposed to flow through environments. Um, we just wrote a nice little convenience function so that instead of our conditional in the code base saying if you're in the test environment then do blah, you just say, is my feature set? Do this, otherwise just do whatever you were doing before. Um, and then in our, in our YAML based Hira store data thingamajig, we pretty much just set what it's supposed to be. Is it supposed to be on in the test environment? Yes, but off in production. And it works really well for us. Yeah, so um, a lot of that puppet stuff was a way of bridging a lot of the cultural issues that we had before and finding a way through the silo and, and chipping away at that and, and crucially automating a lot of that, that manual activity. So, um, calling upgrades, so what, what we also wanted to do was look at the, all the manual activity that was involved in the release. Um, 
we took a bit of a step back. So the box on the left is what would happen on a single node. We, we deployed a highly available cluster, so at least two nodes will have the exact same copy of an application. And we'll have a load balancer, which will, uh, you know, round robin or whatever, whatever policy we set up, direct traffic to, to either of those nodes. Some, some applications will have more if they have uh, more load. So the, the box on the left shows the manual activity that was involved during the release. So you need to exit an application from, from full membership, stop it, um, remove, the, remove it from the box itself for the young fellow, reinstall it, and then wait for uh, manual testing. So that's where you know, six people were, were tied up while, while we're doing manual, manual testing after these manual deploy commands. And then enter pool. And there are a lot of things that could go wrong here if you forgot to check, hey wait, is, is node B in the pool while I'm removing node A from the pool? If, we don't check that, then we'll have an outage. Um, that was kind of easy to do. Uh, a lot of other little examples like that. So we took a step back and said, okay, there's four main, four main roles, um, four main activities that we do. Well, we exit the pool, we upgrade it, we test it, and then we enter the pool. And we do that on, on all those. How can we create some automation to do that for us? And how can we do it safely? At the same time, we were trying to uh, find a way to use Puppet more and more for automating our deploys. So, we were looking into how can we get Puppet to do this for us. The closer we looked into it, the more we realized that Puppet's great, a great config management tool. So it's great for on a particular server, on a particular node, uh, installing an app and working out all the complex interdependencies with configuration and other software, and installing everything needed for that application. But when it comes to uh, the idea of orchestrating that between a lot of other uh, nodes and a lot of other servers, it's going to get really complex as, as soon as we try and put all that automation into Puppet. It's going to need to know how to talk to other hosts. It's going to need to know which hosts is this application on, and, and all the timing around around that. Whereas that's not really Puppet's job. Um, so we did a bit of research, and we realised that there is a bit of a distinction currently um, in, in the best DevOps tools that are available between orchestration and config management. More and more tools are trying to cross that cross that bridge. But we already had Puppet in place, and we had Fabric uh, Fabric scripts, as I mentioned earlier. So we we chose Fabric as our orchestration tool. And it was, it was great at being able to orchestrate a lot of these different activities uh, on, on different boxes. So the diagram shows a bit about that, the, um, the roles involved in that whole thing. Right? This is our what fabric uh, code base, our what if fabric code base. CM1 is our public management box, uh, a monitoring box, our load balances, and uh, the, the nodes that the application was installed on, so app one and app two, say. Same copy of the service that's all on to be given app notice. So going across the right in terms of time, just jump to that first purple box. We want to check that the, the uh, RPM that we're about to be about to install is actually available in the Yum repo that that box can talk to. Um, then we want to check that uh, check the pool status. So you can jump on the box and say, hey, pool membership, is there at least one other node still in the pool? If not, you're gonna can fail. So there's a bit of safety that we can build in that we can get with the then exit the pool, do that safely. Various other checks and balances that we could do. And then, then we had the, um, this is where we started orchestrating Puppet. So Fabric would jump onto the node and say, uh, all right, run a Puppet agent command. We, we don't run Puppet in, in daemon mode, in, in no, no op daemon mode to just go and get stuff as soon as it's ready. We want to have more control for exactly when, when we do stuff in production environments. So it's kind of a push-pull kind of mechanism. We'll jump on the box and then tell it to update itself. Restart the app, run those compliance tests, run those smoke tests. If anything fails in any of these, it just fails, fails, the, fails the release. Then you've got optional manual releasing for uh, manual testing for the release team, and then you enter the pool. And then repeat that cycle on, on the next node. And, the next. and it was all driven by configuration. When we first wrote, wrote the, um, the scripts behind this, we were still in that downward spiral, that kind of that negative, um, uh, negative situation where they should be doing that, they should be doing that, and the company how much work they're going to do. In that situation, when we wrote these scripts, there's no way that an ops person was going to run it just in fully automated mode. Um, no one just wants to write some automation that's been run some automation that's just been given to them without having the ability to, you know, make sure that this is this is going to do exactly what um, what I would want to do. So we we created a, an interactive flag, so interactive equals true is the default. And then they could step through and they could approve every single step. Yes, I want to do this, I want to do this. And then over time, uh, we built up the trust, we built up the, um, the faith in that tool. And um, 
now it's running fully, fully automatic mode. There's a bit of summary from it, it's not really all that important. Um, if we zoom in, that's where it's running the smoke test. So an example of jumping onto the jumping onto this box, running hello world service smoke test, it just runs that, sh that shell script. If that shell script isn't provided with RPMs now, we'll fail the build. We'll fail the release and say, you haven't given us a smoke test, that means you probably don't know what you're doing. Uh, as long as that passes, then uh, we say, yep, testing's passed, and we can move on. Cool. So, um, we've talked about some technical stuff, and we've talked about standardization stuff. Um, I also wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the team structure that we have at What If. Um, in late 2013, uh, our CIO did a, an IT shared services unit reorg. Um, so previously we had a bunch of project focused development teams and they were led by PMs or senior BAs and, and we had off, off to the side just kind of lurking equally. Um, <laughs> so after our reorg we um, moved to this houses concept so um, it's basically a group of you know developers, testers, BAs um, but they're led by a senior developer and they're project, they're not project focused, they're technical debt and service delivery focused. Um, for projects, we form ad hoc teams, um, pull, we pull developers, um, testers, BAs, from various houses to work on a project for a short period of time, and then they go back home. But always there's a focus on tech debt and service delivery, which is awesome, actually. It's been, I think, a really good change. Um, we've done a lot around tech debt um, reduction in the past sort of six months since this happened, so it's been good. Um, at the same time, um, some resources were borrowed to form the continuous delivery team. Um, Matt and I are both members of that team. We have another senior developer, um, a test lead, and a risk analysis and process improvement BA. Um, so there's just the five of us. Our missions are um, technical innovation. We understood that by withdrawing um, a sysadmin from the ops team, which is already under a lot of load, like the things would get worse in the short term. But the hope was um, that, and is, uh, that uh, in the medium to long term, things would get better because we'd be, able, we'd, be, we'd be able to focus on technical innovations within our little team and then spread them out to the, to the rest of the organization. Um, another of our, of our tasks is a sort of third level support, we call it. I don't think it really is technically third level support, but they're really gnarly problems that, that mean that architects and senior developers that sh should really be working on their own stuff, um, they, you know, they get pulled in to look at all these you know, major production issues. We do that now so that those people can focus on their own jobs. Um, and the third one, which is the simplest but also the most complicated, is communication. So we are communication facilitators. We're not trying to be heroes. Um, we don't know it all, and we don't go and do it all for everyone. Um, we are trying to promote collaboration. Um, we have heaps of chat rooms, like we have chat rooms for ops people and DevOps people, and um, test environment chat rooms. And initially, those chat rooms were like um, everyone would go in and then ask a question, and then we answer the question. But now it's much more like peer to peer. Lots and lots of questions are asked and answered without us even getting involved, like before we even get back to our desk sort of thing, um, which is really awesome. Like, I think that's the goal to get, you know, someone, a dev asks a question and then the ops person just answers without, you know, before the discussion never happened. Um, another thing that we started doing was this weekly DevOps stand up or forum. Um, anybody who's interested from the organization, like from business people don't normally come, but anyone from IT can come along and um, hear about what we've been doing in, in the con continuous delivery team, um, can raise problems or issues or ask for, ask for help, uh, they can raise what they're, what they're doing to a wider audience if they want to. Um, and additionally, like we in the CD team attend development stand-ups as well um, when necessary to help out with, with whatever we can. And, fingers on pulses and whatnot. Um, and the last thing that we instituted was this idea of uh, the DevOps champions through IT. 
Um, so as I mentioned before, there's only five of us in the continuous delivery team and there's an IT staff of about 180 or 200 people. That's like spread a little bit thin to talk to everyone. So we, um, we kind of <coughs> volunteered a few developers who were um, yeah, sympathetic to our cause, if you like. Uh, and we, um, we use them as touch points to help get the message out to their teams um, and to get them on board with stuff like we might bounce ideas off them before um, before taking them to a wider audience just to make sure that you know it's not completely off the wall. Um, so it's working quite well. Yeah, and someone asked me today, um, you know, how how did how did you do that? How did you get to the point where you you CIO and senior management setting up a continuous delivery team? Um, and I guess there was a lot of groundwork that was laid before that. So back in 2012, we started a study group around the continuous delivery book. So we grabbed the 15 chapters from that big thick book. Um, and we were in that middle of that downward spiral where people wouldn't really talk to each other, but we had kind of a grassroots movement, an underground movement. Um, and we got together in our own times, lunch times, and we'd read through a chapter a week. Someone would be a chapter leader, and they would um, take notes and you know, encourage, promote conversation. And it, it did. It, it, um, there were a lot of issues that were raised. And, if we started that, that ball rolling towards where we could have, start having some of those standardization discussions and improvements. Um, and and one, of our, uh, one of our managers came along to that and uh, he read the first chapter and was like, right, I'm sold. How do we do this? So it, it took a long time after that, but um, he, he's, now one, he's now the production delivery support manager um, and the CIO is fully on board with it all. So you know, just little, little movements you can, by grassroots, you can start um, influencing that, but also the senior management. Uh, yeah, what is, what is Slipway? So we've been talking about um, rolling upgrades and, and standards and fabric and how we had a lot of technical stuff and that was sort of happening underground in a way with the grassroots movement and then the reorg happened and the CD team came on board and we started promoting this rolling upgrade more and more in our releases. Um, as part of this whole reorg structure, we wanted to um, take a step back and look at all of the problems we had with our release process, all the manual activities. So we had this big, big review. We got lots of different people, lots of different workshops, running on lots of ideas. Our business analyst, our risk, risk analysis guy, Andreas, he had this massive mind map that he created of all of these issues, and it would take ages to scroll through and, and find this isn't connected to that one. And this, and the biggest problems that we had were in our release process, and you know that how it took ages to go from uh, development complete into production. So what we did is we uh, we took a, a step back from that, and we. Um, we created this idea of a simple, lightweight, independent pathway. This idea of the slipway of a, a boat launching quickly into the troubled waters of production. Um, and this, the simple means simple rules. So um, just create a, a lot of um, just create a, a bunch of simple opinionated rules about um, we're going to create a fast path for you, but you have to do this and this and this, which is uh, not going to tie up uh, a lot of expensive resources during the release. And the I is independent, which is really important, a uh, really important concept, which has uh, worked really, really well for us. And this is the idea that when you are releasing an application, that can be the only, that's the only thing that you can be doing. Um, so we'll guarantee you a fast path if you, it's the only thing you're doing. So any database changes, network changes, firewall rules, user creation, um, anything that of that nature that needs to be set up in the environment beforehand, you should do that as a, as a change request to the environment. Um, previously, all of that was bundled up into a release extra stuff that could go wrong on release day. Uh, if your application that you're releasing depends on changes in another application, you have to release that application first. So you can't release five applications all at once, which is another problem with releasing. So it's kind of totally flipped the way that we do development. So no longer are we trying to batch up a whole bunch of stuff and more and more stuff to, to get it out in one big chunk. We're trying to get out lots of little small batch sizes, little small changes um, using feature switches really heavily. So the big focus of Slipway was on reducing that cycle time and getting it down as much as we could. So this is the, the old process that we showed and how it would take weeks to get up into the priority and there would be uh, days of effort involved in releasing, a lot of manual activity, a lot of that prioritization, that superstitious kind of gatekeeping process. We took a step back from there and said, all right, well, if we do this independent style of releasing, we can actually start parallelizing. Um, and you'll see on the right, it's now taking hours to do that instead of days. So the load testing gatekeeping process is now optional. We've now put uh, that risk mitigation back onto the teams and say, we trust you. If you think it needs a load test, then, then go ahead and do it. We, we trust you know what you're doing. But because we've given them a way to reduce their batch size and, and get it out, in, you, you can get out actually in minutes rather than hours, 
because we've provided that, um, we're confident that they could have, do a quick turnaround if there is a performance problem in production, they could actually go back to their code base and, and, and fix it and, and release it that same day. So that's one, one way that we've actually mitigated the risk that previously we were you know, putting, up, putting up the walls. So we've got a confluence page of slipway conditions, um, spelling out exactly what, what is the best practice in order to get your stuff out, out to production. And if the, the team isn't following this, then the, the ops person that's kind of sitting in the middle here um, is able to say, hey, this doesn't match the rules and we're going to reject you because if you don't match the rules, you're going to tie up you know, the over-constrained ops resources that, that we have and you're going to hold up me from getting out another app which, which has followed the, the best practices. Um, so just some examples, you have to comply with the standards, so that if the compliance test fails during the rolling upgrade, you have a slipway. There can be no other dependencies on other things, as we already talked about, no database changes, no time of release restrictions, so there is no calendar. You just put it into slipway and it's going to, when it gets to the stage where it needs some ops involvement, they're just going to go and do it as soon as possible, as soon as they're ready to do it. No manual testing at all, so we give you, we're giving you the avenue for smoke tests, you can write smoke test scripts, that's your avenue for testing. Um, there's no manual testing. If you need to do manual testing during a release before it goes into the pool, uh, then you're, you're, you're out of slipway. So we've, we've still got the old process path, the old release path in, in place, so people can still choose, choose to use that, it's, it's optional. Um, feature switches have to be in Zookeeper, that, that reduces the manual activity that we used to have around them. So this is, uh, again, we're using Confluence. We love Confluence. Um, I guess just, just a, a note about that. Um, it, is, it is a great tool, but yeah, it's not the, the world's best automation tool. But it, it, was, it was what we always had in place, um, you know, culturally, and it's what, what was already there. So we're just building on top of what we've already got, making small moves and not trying to change everything all at once, because if you do that, it's, it's, it makes it easier to, it, it makes it more likely to be rejected as an, an organ donor, if you like. So, uh, just there's some scripts that, that a developer can run as their command line, and it, it will put the app, um, create the release notes for the application. So you can see the create release notes, and they're almost ready. They'll type another command, and it will go into the next next box, and ops will pick it up, and they'll see, okay, this is ready. Ops will actually get a, an item in their chat window that says, hey, this is ready for you to do some activity. And the first person available will say, hey, does anyone mind if I, if I take this? Then. Uh, as soon as that's done, it's ready for testing. So the teams can still do load testing or any manual exploratory testing in the staging environment. They might just type another command and say, yep, we're ready, ready to go to the next stage. Um, ready, ready for production deployment. And then there's a list of all the stuff that's, that's already been deployed to production this week. And we've got some fancy graphs, Andreas lots of graphs and charts. You can see the, the pie chart there, so we're slowly taking over the, the uh, number of uh, the types of releases that we're doing. This is a slipway chapter. Alex mentioned before, we got a lot of bunch of chat rooms. Um, big, really powerful concept to connect people that wasn't, wasn't there before, they just didn't have an avenue. You can't imagine um, life without them now. So the Slipway channel, it's all automated. The Fabric scripts will um, just push messages into there. And so you can see here, someone signed off deployment to production. Um, you can see the smoke test passing, what, all the steps that are happening so everyone can, can visualize exactly what's going on. Previously, those chat rooms but for releases would be hidden to only those people and there wouldn't be that visibility and that um, order trail where you can easily see exactly what went on. And the automatic release notes that are now generated, so we've turned the old manual release notes into more of an automated thing. We can actually put things like cycle time in there. So you can see it only took 10 minutes to deploy to two nodes in uh, the staging D dry run environment. The DR testing, we didn't do any, we just moved straight to the next phase for this app and the production deployment took 15 minutes. So you can see within half an hour, um, the apps out in, in production. They would have taken days before with that complex, um, that complex calendar system that we had. Um, yeah, more charts. So you can see a uh, number of releases that are happening each month since August last year. And how Slipway is taking, taking over. The, the, the thing in this slide is the amount of time in each Slipway release is really small. And the amount of people involved in that is really small. So the amount of, the, the cost of actually doing one of those releases is just a fraction of, of the old we turned the old release process groupway. Someone said, oh, I'm on the groupway. And we're like, that's an awesome name. It's yeah, really slow. Um, so how did that affect the, the roles? We looked at these last time. Now developers deploy your product environment on every commit. So you've got build servers. Um, when you make a change, you'll actually, um, 
use the rolling upgrade scripts, the exact same scripts we use in all other environments will we'll fire off. Um, so we'll get all that early, early feedback that we previously didn't have until, until production. Uh, the compliance test, the smoke test, all of that runs with the rolling upgrade. We tweaked Maven to allow us to release whenever we wanted instead of having to go back and manually type Maven release commands, which is, um, you know, we, we hold up releases and it's error prone. And we consolidated build servers. We used to have a Jenkins build server for each team. And so teams wouldn't be able to see, unless they knew the address to their other team's build servers, wouldn't be able to copy easily all of the automation that other teams were working on. Ops couldn't see what devs would, they would know this team, that team, all different build servers. Consolidated on a single um, build server called Team City. And um, we created build pipelines straight out of the team's delivery book, pretty much. Um, and that, that enabled that much, much better visibility over where all of the teams were at, what was going on. And it enabled Ops to see uh, exactly what devs were working on. And now Ops are starting to write to create builds as well to centralize that, that automation. And it's a, it's a great place where we can all work together. QA, um, now, now the uh, deployments to test environments is all automated using, again, the exact same rolling upgrade scripts. <coughs> so they can spend more of their time on actual exploratory testing rather than the manual activity that they shouldn't really have to do. And we're doing more and more acceptance testing with Cucumber and those sorts of things. And ops now have, have the uh, confidence that an app's been through the compliance testing, so they don't have so much of that manual activity. I'm sure that's pretty clear from what we said. Um, they have confidence in rejecting an app if the compliance tests fail, or the smoke tests. No longer is it, oh, I really shouldn't let this through, but I'm gonna need a lot of pressure. It's, hey, you know, this doesn't meet the, what we've all agreed is, is the standards. The standards and the compliance tests are kind of the demilitarized zone. You know, we all agree that was the best. And, if you don't agree, that's fine, we'll change it next time. But for now, that's the best ideas we've got. And uh, yeah, less idiosyncrasies, and don't have that explosion of uh, cheat sheet notes. So we look at a couple of the principles that we ex could extract from uh, the lessons that we learned. Um, there's a lot of things we learned, it's just a, a sub subset, and Alex will Yeah, so um, the first um, first thing that we learned, one of the first things we learned on this journey um, was about cultural change. We we learned that you can't change culture with big, wide, sweeping, overnight pro proclamations. You'll be doomed to fail if you do that. You put such massive inertia to overcome, usually, if you've got a cultural problem. Um, but you can change things little by little. Um, you really need to start with the culture that you have, and you need to, to be accepting of that, even if your culture is full of distrust, um, people playing blame games, or people in their comfort zone being complacent. If that's what you've got, well, it's kind of what you're stuck with and you have to change it a little bit each time. Um, you can gradually work towards communication and collaboration, um, but don't <coughs> force it. Um, <laughs> people are full of idiosyncrasies. Uh, idiosyncrasies. Um, as technical people, we're not often the most sort of social beasts. Um, we don't really want to have deep and meaningful conversations with other people. We just want to get things done right. So you have, to, you have to be understanding of that and work with that. Um, and I think it's also important to get everyone involved if you want to make a change to, to the way things are done or to the way people talk to each other. Um, if you let people be involved, then they get to have a sense of ownership um, and they have, they have you know, a sense of control over their own destin destiny, which is really important. I think. Yeah, on the rolling upgrade scripts, we've got a, an argument, interactive, interactive people's faults is how slip away that automation works and we kind of joke now culturally engineers prefer interactive people's faults or times. Find ways to work around that and chat rooms and things like that's a great way. Um, strongly type your discussions. So we found in that in that downward spiral uh, where it's really hard to see see through the doom and the gloom, it's um, really hard to have conversations with, with different people around a lot of there's a lot of choices that we can make and a lot of things that we can do. It's really hard to have discussions. So if you can label conversations, come up with good, catchy, easy to pronounce names, it really helps to drive forward the conversation. So for example, uh, we talked about rolling up, right? that's the label that we put on you know, this release process and the automation around it. So when you, when you say rolling upgrade, everyone knows exactly what you're talking about. It's not like, oh, the new release process, what is that the new, new release process? Is that um, Slipway, again, nice, it, 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 no one's ever heard of Slipway in terms of IT before, so this is a unique thing that we're doing at Wally, so you, come up with what you, you need to learn what is slip on. It's not uh, what is the release process, because everyone has a different thing in their mind about what that means, but slip is a concrete thing that we can label. 
gimmicks for puppet feature branches. Virtual branches are totally totally off the wall idea for, for a lot of people, so come and in, learn, learn about that. Uh, lightweight, so before that we just call them non glass fish apps. That's a bit of a, bit of a mouthful. Just call them lightweight. And uh, state tables and transition diagrams are a great way to kind of find a way through through uh, through a lot of those conversations. So um, for our glass fish apps we wrote down a bit of a table of Depending on what state it's currently in and what command you run, what's it going to do? What's the next state that's going to be? What's it going to transition to? And we found that there's actually a lot of errors, a lot of question marks, a lot of we don't actually know uh, what should happen here. So for ops, you know, working, you know, in different states and typing different commands, they don't know what to expect for different applications. So once we did that table, it was kind of obvious. Oh wait, you know, we don't have a, a way forward for, for these things. But um, with the lightweight. When we introduce the lightweight apps, we're able to take a step back and say, okay, well, we're going to address each of these as, as we go through. Um, state transition tables and diagrams are a great way to, to help uh, drive forward conversation. As part of that, be opinionated, but, but not arrogant. So it's great to have opinions because that helps us to all agree on something and to go forward and, and not to say they should do that, they should do this, but we, we need to do this. Um, but, but don't be so arrogant to think that the decision you've made now is the one that should stick forever decisions we make now are basically the, the legacy of tomorrow. We need to be able to move forward in the future. And we talked about making it easy to do the right thing. So when there's thousands of th possible things you could do, you're going to end up doing you know, the easy thing, which is not necessarily going to be the, the thing that we can, we can all move forward with. So imagine if we made the easy thing the right thing. There was only one way to do it, and we're all a lot happier. And that's why the standard compliance and that testing has helped. Um, and crucially also the, the testing uh, approach, if someone wants to upgrade their application to the latest innovation, the latest standard that we all agree on, they can just uh, flick, flick the switch that takes them from 2.0 to 2.3 and then uh, run the rolling upgrade or run the compliance test against it and they'll get a list of all the errors, all the stuff that they, they haven't done, things that they haven't thought of. So they can actually test for um, you know, operational changes. And we're bringing a lot of that ops stuff that was previously done manually, bringing all that back into dev test drive that, that functionality. Another principle we learned was reducing transaction costs before batch size. So what does that mean? So traditionally, we're, we're told if you, re you, if you reduce batch size, then you, you reduce risk. And we knew that we wanted to get there, but it was really hard to reduce the batch size when we had this complex um, way of releasing. So the, um, if you've ever seen this diagram from Don Ryan, it's a bit hard to get your head around it at first, but the idea that the smaller the batch size, um, the higher the cost it is to, to do releases really frequently, um, and that increases your the total cost. So there's a sweet spot in, in the middle where your batch size actually needs to be a certain size. Um, you need to batch up a whole bunch of stuff because if you just kept doing lots of little stuff, you actually end up um, burning out ops because you need so many ops people to just service the queue to frequently do lots of things. But if you can get the, the cost of, of transactions, the, the release cost, you can get that down to something more like a, a flat line, like it's now we're going to be 100% flat, there's a curve there somewhere. Then uh, your total cost is actually, so you actually are rewarded in this case for, um, for keeping your batch size down. Yeah, so this is the last little one that we want to talk about uh, the carrot, not the stick. This was a hard one for me because I'm a sysadmin. I like to beat people up when they do the wrong thing, that's how we roll. Um, but, you know, I think there's a better way. Um, we, we fell into the stick approach for years. You know, you're doing it wrong, you should be doing this, why aren't you doing this? Like, why don't you know how to do the right thing? Um, I mean, we never actually told them what the right thing to do was, but let's not go into that. Um, you know, there's heaps of blame games, recriminations, um, and very important to note that the business wasn't aware of all this. IT was just slow and costly and kind of crap. Um, so they, they had no visibility, they had no idea that, that, that they could help, they were just like, oh, what can you do? And it also meant that we had a lot of technical debt piling up. Um, so nowadays, in the past year or so, a couple of years, we're trying out the carrot approach, especially with Slipway. We've offered a great new alternative, but it's an alternative, it's completely optional. I mean, if you choose to go with it, then you'll get way more frequent releases, and if you do fail, then it doesn't really matter, you can just start again with very little penalty. Um, um, you can release with far greater frequency, you can go out multiple times a day if you want to. I mean, it's still optional, but you really want it, right? Um, 
So, like, it, it really brought people on board. Like, we still have releases that go out the old way because they need to, because they've got database scripts or whatever that they can't do backwards compatibility for. Um, but, but more and more people are coming on board because they, they can, like, they have the option to make the choice to go forward. It's not being forced upon them. Um, and the great thing about it is that the business is actually invested in the process. Um, our team presented uh, the slipway to um, the executive team, including the CEO, and they were like, all for it. How can we do, how can we help you? How can we, how can we make this happen even better? Um, because they can see the benefit that, you know, someone in the business has an idea and by the end of the week it's actually out in production. Like it's the promise of Agile, but actually getting to production. Um, and, <laughs> and to the point where we saw a story card a couple of weeks ago, like as a business product owner, I want this app to be on the slipway so I can get features faster, which is awesome. Like the business is totally invested, and I think that when you get like when you get that level of organisational kind of coherence, where you're all going in the in the right direction, it's really great. slide before, um, uh, the kind of old way before we started on this journey of people throwing things over the wall. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is what it, sort of what it looks like now. We've kind of started to tear down the wall. We still have heaps and heaps of apps, um, but they're mainly on this lightweight um, uh, framework. And so deploys, instead of being super painful, they're fast and pretty much painless, uh, usually. Um, and the most important thing is that now development teams and ops are talking to each other about stuff. Um, we have, like, it's not all like roses. We still have spats and misunderstandings and big arguments and massive production problems. But now people are way more like, likely to get, you know, the dev team and the architects and the ops team together and talk about it instead of just burying it and just the simmering sense of resentment under the surface. Like, it's, it's, it's much better now, I think. Yeah. So um, we talked about a few things, things tonight. It's kind of just, just a subset of, of all the stuff that we've done. Um, we've tried to focus on the, the, uh, how we get that cycle time down. And the, the way we did that was a mixture of cultural hacks, um, little incremental changes to, to cultural stuff, but also a lot of automation. So it's, 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 I guess what we've learned is really important to address both things. And you just try and do one thing without the other. Thanks for listening tonight.